Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Liz Baker and I am a research scientist with PrevNet. And be, on behalf of our team, I would like to welcome everyone. Wherever you're located today, please join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued spirit and strength of indigenous peoples. We're bringing today's webinar from the community of practice to address youth dating violence funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. We are um, very pleased to have Elder Lionel Houston, Marissa ben Van Babel, and Rochelle Reddy with us today to reflect on Indigenous evaluation methodologies. So before I introduce the presenters, I'll just go through the format for today. So the webinar will run for 90 minutes, and we would really like it to be as interactive as possible. So please ask questions along the way using the chat box. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end to address your question, and we'll save all questions until that time. Um, and then at the end of the webinar in the chat box, you'll see a link to the evaluation of today's webinar. So we really value the responses um, of all of you to help us um, guide planning for future webinars. And just so you know, all of your feedback is anonymous. So we would really appreciate it if you would take the time um, to complete the survey at the end. It will take only about two minutes. And then once you've completed that evaluation form, you'll then be directed to a website um, to receive your certification of attendance. So at this point, you'll enter your name and your email to get that certificate of attendance, but know that your name and email will not be connected in any way to your responses. So again, it will all remain anonymous in terms of your actual feedback. The webinar is being recorded today. So after the webinar, we'll send out a link to everyone who registered so they can share the recording or listen to it if they weren't able to join us today. And so now that the housekeeping is done, it is my pleasure to start to introduce today's presenters. Um, Elder Lionel Huster, Houston is a member of the Saging First Nation in Northeastern Manitoba. He's dedicated his life to working with indigenous people, helping them to reconnect with their identity and culture. Lionel has traveled throughout North America, attending many communities, delivering workshops on self-awareness, self-identity, and cultural awareness, and has spent the majority of his career working with Indigenous youth. The past 10 years, Lionel has been involved with corrections as a spiritual caregiver. Marissa Ben Babel is a doctoral candidate in the School and Applied Child Psychology program at the University of Calgary. She grew up in Red Deer with her three siblings and parents. Marissa is of European descent and is a grateful visitor on Treaty 7 territory. Her research focuses on resilience among Indigenous youth. Marissa is also a project research assistant with the Hope Lab, supporting projects related to school-based mental health and program evaluation. And finally, Rochelle Reddy is a woman of Métis ancestry living in Treaty 1 territory in what is known as Winnipeg, Manitoba. She grew up in Winnipeg with her three siblings and her parents grew up in Brandon, Manitoba, and her grandparents resided in rural Western Manitoba. Rochelle's Nana is a registered member of MMF with connections to the Red River Métis. Rochelle is also a registered social worker, a yoga teacher, and the research coordinator for Ode Zigo Ode Heart to Heart Project. It is a project in partnership between Nadinawe and the University of Manitoba that is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And Rochelle is currently completing her Master of Social Work, Indigenous Knowledges at the University of Manitoba. So I now invite Elder Lionel Houston to lead an opening invocation for our meeting today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. I just, uh, I'm gonna say a prayer to start things off. This is uh, as the Indigenous people. We always start things off in a good way. And so, uh, this is one of the teachings that we teach our children today, is that when you wake up in the morning, you should always say that prayer to start your day off in a good way. And then at the end of the day, to give thanks so that you end the day in a good way. And we do this every day so that uh, we appreciate the gift of life. So uh, when we start something, we always open with a prayer. And I'm gonna ask people, you know, um, they have their own reasons why you're here and, and what you're hoping to gain. And um, maybe in your own way, you can pray for those things, that whatever it is you're looking for and uh, that you can find here in this, in this webinar. Um, and if not, uh, uh, 
it'll come to you because you're asking for it. Um, the other thing I, I tell people is that don't listen word for word, only listen to what belongs to you. Okay? And uh, this is important teaching because uh, if we take on things that don't belong to us, it creates confusion. And if it creates confusion, then we, it creates doubt. Okay, so I know education is important, and then you learn as much as you as you uh, as you can. But uh, whatever touches your heart, that's going to be your strength. That's what you need to focus on and get that understanding, so that you can uh, uh, better equip yourself with your field of uh, a purpose and. and existence. So um, I just wanted to share that with you so that uh, uh, you're aware as you're, as you're going through uh, meeting people in your life that, that uh, listen with your heart so that you know what belongs to you and what doesn't. The stuff that, and I'm not saying don't listen to the other stuff. I'm saying those are considered seeds that are planted. And when the time is right, you will nurture them and they will, they will become part of the bigger picture of what you're doing. And so with that, I just wanted to say, which, and I'll start my prayer and then, uh, uh, and then we'll begin. Bonjour, Wapshke, my Egan, this cosmic command, build for them. Grandfather, it's your grandchildren here. We gathered together to come and talk about, about Indigenous people and, and the relationship between the, the two worlds. We ask you, Grandfather, to guide us as we go through this, this meeting and, and uh, sharing our wisdom and knowledge with one another about how we can become equal and, and balanced once again. We ask you, Grandfather, to, to send those messages to us in a good way that we can understand. I also ask you, Grandfather, that we listen to the presenters with an open heart so that uh, that message can resonate within our heart so that it becomes our medicine. I ask you to bless everybody here in a good way and Say miigwech for bringing us together. Hope all my relation. Miigwech. Thank you so much. And with that, we will um, turn it over to Marissa. Get this loaded. There we go. Okay, um, can you see that okay, Liz? Is it, there we go, perfect. All right, wonderful to be here with you all this morning. So yes, my name is Marissa and I'm going to be presenting some of the findings from a review paper that I put together. Um, I want to just acknowledge Dr. Dana Exner Cortens and Dr. Wendy Craig for their support and advice as I put together uh, the paper that I'm going to be summarizing. I want to just acknowledge that, you know, in putting together the information for this, I tried to find the best literature I could in terms of that that was done by Indigenous peoples or that was conducted with Indigenous peoples. And I hope that um, I just do justice in, in summarizing and sharing this information. So I will start by providing an overview of Indigenous methodologies and Indigenous evaluation research. Um, I'm gonna specifically be talking about a framework called Indigenous Evaluation Framework uh, that was done by Dr. Joanne LaFrance. And throughout these topics, I just really hope to emphasize the importance of relationships throughout the research process. I also just want to start by acknowledging my positionality. So positionality refers to the social and political context that shape one's identity. Uh, this can be in terms of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability status. And acknowledging positionality is important as, you know, these various factors influence one's experiences and insights about the world, and thus influences one's beliefs, attitudes, and understandings. So one's positionality can thus influence research topics, the way they're interpreting, the findings, the methodology chosen, and so it's always important to just start with that self-location. So I am a cisgender heterosexual woman who is of European ancestry. My grandparents uh, came over from the Netherlands 
I was born and raised in a middle-class household in central Alberta. And I just acknowledge that, you know, this work is limited by my worldview as a settler. Um, in my time um, with the University of Calgary, I've been very lucky to conduct my master's thesis and now my doctoral dissertation with colleagues, knowledge holders and elders from Treaty 7 territory, so specifically the Gainai Nation, uh, as well as Sutena Nation. And so I just also want to acknowledge the, the role that they've had in my learning and my journey. And I just hope that throughout this talk, um, there are some ideas for how other settlers can more meaningfully engage in their evaluation work and deconstruct Eurocentric research ideas. So we'll start again by looking at what is evaluation research and what is methodology, and then we'll explore um, what I found are Indigenous approaches to these topics. So the National Collaborating Center for Aboriginal Health uh, has a fantastic article on Indigenous approaches to program evaluation. And they talk about the benefits that program evaluation can have in terms of better understanding goals, effectiveness, program strategies, cost effectiveness, justifying funding, um, and common elements to an evaluation include gathering information, making judgments about that information, and then providing feedback. And I love the three questions that they provided in their article in terms of summarizing the process of evaluation research. So they say, what is the program about and what needs to be known? The so what question, so is the program relevant? Is it making a difference? If so, why does the program or service work the way it does? And with that information, we ask the now what question. So what do we do about it? How do we make the program better, sustainable, um, share it more broadly, things like that. And now we'll look at what is uh, methodology. And before we talk about that, we'll back up to talk about epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge or how one comes to know about reality. So in our day-to-day -day life, we're all trying to gain knowledge in various ways. Um, we can gain knowledge by observing others, watching social media, TV, reading journal articles and books. Uh, when we really try to figure out, you know, what is knowledge? How do we know something is true versus just thinking about it? We encounter interesting questions um, about theories of knowledge, such as, is there only one way to know? Is knowledge universal? Um, and with this understanding, we then look at methodology, which is the approach one takes to conduct research in a systematic way. So this is how one uses their epistemology to gain knowledge about reality. And then from that, there are specific methods and techniques such as surveys, interviews, arts-based methods uh, that one uses to gather knowledge. So some examples of these different points, perhaps some hold that there is one reality, and this is often conceptualized in positivist and post-positivist approaches, uh, that there's only a single reality, and thus research needs to be as objective as possible in order to gather that. Um, other epistemologies may be found in critical theory, where reality is fluid, it's dependent on context, and thus researchers are trying to improve reality through social change and may use methodologies such as participatory research approaches. Um, but what is Indigenous epistemology and methodology? And I'm going to draw on the work of Sean Wilson. He is from a Cree nation in Northern Manitoba and has a fantastic book that I use for so many things. So research a ceremony. Um, so I'm gonna draw on his work. He talks about an indigenous epistemology being relationality. Um, so relationships do not merely shape reality, they are reality. Knowledge is not an individual entity but it's relational. So it's shared with all of creation, the cosmos, animals, plants. It's not just between a uh, researcher and participants. It's also the researcher's relationship to the topic, to the research being done. Um, and with this understanding, researchers must fulfill their role in relationships through an indigenous methodology. Another um, fantastic, I don't know where that book is, but individual that I commonly reference, uh, is Margaret Kovach. 
And she argues that, and I quote, knowledge is neither, there it is, thank you, Rochelle, we always have our handy books. Uh, knowledge is neither acultural nor apolitical. And there is need to recognize distinctly indigenous ways of knowing that influence one's approach to doing research and by extension, evaluation. So an indigenous methodology as described by Sean Wilson is relational accountability. So gathering knowledge to fulfill one's end of the research relationships. So it's grounded in the community, that's the relational piece and actions that demonstrate respect, reciprocity, and responsibility, so being accountable. So when we think of respect, we're thinking of um, respecting different knowledges, respecting the people that we're working with, coming in with an open mind, reciprocity, we're giving back, um, we're considering is everyone benefiting from the research process, is there shared learning? And we must always remember our responsibility to enact an ethical research process. Uh, so from, you know, this epistemology to methodology, we then select methods that are building a relationship. So asking yourself, do my methods allow me to build a relationship with the participants, with the research topic? It's critical to think beyond the evaluation project and just consider how are you holding relationships at the center? Um, so when I think back to my master's thesis with Guy Nye Nation, I held relationships at the center by just taking months to get to know the community, volunteering at different events, um, being there to serve the elders. I uh, conducted my work with the middle school, so I was just showing up, getting to know the teachers. I was being you know, respectful and transparent by sharing exactly what it was I was doing there, my intention doing a thesis, that the results um, would be in a document, but there was opportunity for them to look at the transcripts afterward to co-create the themes with me um, and just being responsible by offering co-authorship on any publications, things like that. So always remembering uh, your role of holding relationships at the center. And I just wanted to share um, one final quote that uh, Sean Wilson has in his book. So he says, your methodology has to ask different questions. Rather than asking about validity or reliability, you are asking, how am I fulfilling my role in this relationship? This becomes my methodology, an indigenous methodology. By looking at relational accountability or being accountable to all my relations. Um, and I just wanted to share um, one other quick uh, piece about methodology that I found in a different article, because the intent here is not to promote a pan-Indigenous approach where um, there's only one way of doing things. We can hold relationships at the center by truly getting to know the community and working with in their tribal epistemologies and methodologies. But I really loved um, this example of Indigenous methodology by Vivian Estrad, who draws from her Maya culture to describe the tree of life. So she put together this beautiful story and metaphor on Indigenous methodology in her community. And we're going to kind of come back to this concept of story in a little bit. But her metaphor for an in, uh, research methodology is that of a tree. So she talks about how the bark provides structure to ensure the values of time are respected in her community. She talks about the trunk with life promoting energies that promote um, relationships and her uh, role in respecting those around her. And then she has the branches of the tree, which are her responsibility to share the protocol with respect and reverence that not only participants deserve, but life itself. And so again, we'll come back to this concept of story um, in a little bit more fully, but a fantastic example to illustrate the importance of tribal knowledge in defining one's methodology. So why does this matter? When we think about evaluation in a historical context, since colonization, uh, governments have often funded programs and required communities to show that they're using the funds as stated or that the program is having the desired impact, otherwise, funds might be cut. So it's a very top-down approach to research and evaluation, and it's being done on communities, not with them. And so we need to ask ourselves, is evaluation being judged against non-Indigenous standards, whose definition of success is being uh, valued in the evaluation? 
Are the strengths of the community being recognized? So there's um, an unfortunately, you know, a lot of history of research being done in a very poor and unethical way with results that don't value the community, perhaps per misrepresent their knowledge. Um, and it leads to a lot of judgment, the continued deficit narratives, continued exploitation of Indigenous peoples. And so we, it needs to be redefined in a way that's an opportunity for learning. And again, just holding that part about relationships at the center. And this really exemplifies Kovacs' quote about research not be, being an apolitical or apolitical process. Uh, so how can we redefine evaluation? Um, some ideas that I drew from Dr. LaFrance's work are that first, the community takes ownership for defining success. Uh, rather than focusing on what are the needs, what are there, you know, the barriers or things going wrong, what does success look like and how can we get there together? Second, allowing the community to tell their story. So what are their values, aspirations, um, holding those central? Third is to be flexible throughout the research process and realize that things may change and shift as you go along, being flexible by allowing, you know, reminding the community that this is their story, how they want to go about measuring it, how they would like to assess and the evaluation is up to them. The topic is flexible, the methods are flexible. And fourth, um, it's just so important to be an advocate, to tell the program story and to make them shine. And again, there's just so much unfortunate evaluation research out there that paints communities in a negative light and frames things from that deficit narrative. And so how can you honor your role in the relationship by highlighting the strengths, making them shine? So now we'll put it all together to talk about an Indigenous evaluation framework. Uh, so this is the article I drew it from, Dr. Joanne LaFrance and colleagues. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa in North Dakota, and she articulates an Indigenous evaluation framework. So throughout this paper, I found her main theme to be that of context first, always coming back to the context, um, considering the historical, social, cultural factors and holding those central in the evaluation. So these are the five steps to the Indigenous uh, evaluation framework. So understanding the context, creating the story, building the scaffolding, planning, implementing and celebrating evaluation and then engaging community and capacity building. And so I'll go into each of these points now. So first understand the context. Before beginning an evaluation, it's critical, as I mentioned, to spend time getting to know the community, exploring the social, historical, and political context that surrounds the program and service you're going to be evaluating, getting, taking time to get to know the values and beliefs in the community, what are their cultural protocols that need to be honored throughout the research? Um, so in doing so, you'll have a better understanding of um, what constitutes a social problem in the community. I'm pulling this all from, um, again, their paper, but I'd even want to reframe that to just be what constitutes, again, as we mentioned earlier, success in the community. Uh, what are appropriate responses to the area of concern identified? What does a meaningful evaluation look like in this community? And what useful knowledge can be gathered to advance the well being of the community? So, once the concept is under, the context is understood, the next step is to develop the story of the program and the research. Um, so, in Eurocentric Western methods of evaluation, we often talk about building a logic model which is um, looking at the resources available, developing short and long-term goals and outcomes, um, but opposed to that kind of linear process that we tend to see, story is the next step here. So story, metaphors, and this kind of goes back to exemplifying what I talked about earlier with the tree of life um, example. So I'll give an example uh, here from their paper. Uh, so they say that this is one example of a community story that was developed for evaluation. So Plains Tribal's winter count. 
a buffalo hide calendar with pictures or symbols depicting memorable events was used as the metaphor for comprehensive project to introduce students to science, nursing, and mathematics. Among tribes of the Great Plains, the winter count was used to record important events over the course of a year, from first snowfall to next first snowfall. The group used this metaphor to represent key relationships and activities of the program. These included environmental restoration, engaging use with elders, and using the outdoors as classrooms. So in reading this story, you can see what their, the hope is, what they're wanting to look at in the evaluation, um, the importance of relationship, the events and timelines that were occurring over the year, but it's really done in a way that honors the traditional knowledge um, and creates a much more like meaningful relationship with the process. So again, it goes back to that idea that we have to hold relationships with participants, but also with the research process. The next phase is scaffolding. Um, so this is kind of analogous to traditional evaluation processes in the sense that you're looking at what factors are we exploring? What are the questions we need to ask? What are the methods? But in Indigenous uh, evaluation, we're accounting for culture and community considerations. So for example, when we consider what methods fit the context, we're also considering what are traditional protocols that need to be followed in this area. Um, an example from Dr. LaFrance is that instead of evaluation questions, which can sometimes come with a bit of a intrusive nature, you reframe it to be evaluation statements. When you're determining how you're going to report the findings, you're working with the community, um, offering that co-authorship, you're collaborating together, uh, you're honoring you know, the values and the processes laid out in OCAP, um, so ownership, um, that this is their knowledge and how are we going to do this together. And then the last two phases, so celebrating, or sorry, planning, implementing, and celebrating. So here we're being inclusive and transparent about the research process. There is ongoing reflection, not only um, with the individuals you're working with, but with yourself. You're always taking time to sit and be like, what am I learning from this? Um, what biases may be coming up for me? what is maybe clouding my judgment? How can I continue to have this open mind? Celebrating success with the community. And then thinking big picture again about engaging that community and capacity building. So ownership of the, of the results. Um, how can you build capacity for this program to continue on, for the community to continue the evaluation? Uh, working with, you know, internal tribal review boards, research committees, ethics boards in the community, and seeking their permission to disseminate the evaluation work. So I just wanted to share some final big picture takeaways of kind of the main themes that were uh, shared overall. So instead of focusing on objectivity, as we tend to do from a Western lens, we're focusing on the context and the relationship that are being shaped throughout the process. And what is the relationship between you and the program and you and the community? Instead of testing the generalizability of a program, again, focusing on context first. How does this program fit the situation that we're in and how does it contribute to local understandings? Um, as opposed to the critiquing that can be done in evaluation, we're, we're focusing on building capacity. And opposed to efficiency, wanting to get the evaluation done quickly, getting results out quickly, we're focusing on taking the time that's needed. And that can be the time to build relationships or the time to reflect on what's being learned. Um, and I loved this quote that was in LaFrance's article, which is, you will know in the future what you have been taught today. And sometimes you really need to just sit with what's been gathered and what's been given with to you for a while in order to reflect on that knowledge that's been given. And so those are hopefully some big takeaways for you. And I just wanted to share this final quote. Um, so in our efforts, we are about becoming. We are always becoming. And so they talk about people becoming. 
not of its finality, but of its becoming, because we are people who are constantly growing and changing and learning. Even as we get older and older, we're still learning. And like in a lot of the older evaluation models and measurements, it's so finant. The achievement score, that one place in becoming, which we know is just a measure of that single moment. So somehow this becoming is not only one element within a single context, but a larger picture. Living within this larger frame and in harmony and in peace and in that sense of place, I think that most evaluation systems have a hard time capturing that. So I love this quote just because it really does emphasize that need to move away from those single scores that really only represent one time and one place to thinking about things more holistically um, and big picture. And so for more information about uh, some of these topics, as well as um, other points. So in the paper, we talk a little bit more about theories that can back up methodologies such as tribal crit. We talk about participatory approaches to research. Uh, and methods such as research conversations or photo voice. So again, um, thank you. It's lovely to be here with you all today. And now I'm excited to hand it over to Rochelle. Thank you, Marissa. Okay, um, so I'm going to be just speaking about uh, the perspective from Ode Jibo Ode, the Heart to Heart Project, which is in Winnipeg in Treaty One Territory. Um, so I'm the research coordinator of Ode Jibo Ode, and Ode Jibo Ode is uh, in collaboration between Nadinawe, uh, which is our relatives' home, and the University of Manitoba, and it's working with primarily urban Indigenous identifying youth. Um, so I will talk about how Ode Jigo Ode has uh, used the Indigenous paradigm of a sacred bundle within our methodology. So as explained by Marissa, a research paradigm can be understood to be a set of beliefs about the world and about gaining knowledge that go together to guide your actions. It's also understood to be include the ontology, the epistemology, the methodology, and the methods. An Indigenous paradigm, as emphasized by Marissa, comes from the fundamental belief that knowledge is relational. So just as the research paradigm outlines values, principles, and methods that are important in the design and implementation of evaluation and research, a bundle also outlines values, principles, and methods, as well as protocols for handling and caring for the bundle. So a bundle is often known as a physical sacred gathering of objects, ideas, gifts, and teachings that take place over the lifetime of an, of an individual. So in the context of a research paradigm, understanding the bundle extends to honoring the holistic, interconnected and unique nature of learning journeys. And the reality is that the bundle is evolving and new teachings and stories can be gathered as you work with your bundle. And one of the most important things about working with a bundle is that it has the caveat that it is important to connect with and build knowledge through mentorship and support, which is also known as relational accountability. Uh, this will be the next slide. So as defined by Wilson, uh, as mentioned by Marissa, relational, relational accountability is grounded in the community, aka it's relational. And actions must demonstrate respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. Relational accountability looks like considering your own relationship with ideas and concepts that you are researching and attempting to explain. And this isn't just about examining biases because we have biases, but then we also have beliefs that then may become biases, but we may not be aware that they're biases. Childhood experiences, educational experiences, our own experiences throughout our lifetime, these all impact our relationship with themes, with ideas, with the topics that we as researchers are trying to understand. And it's also really important to examine your relationship with the participants and the community that the participants are connected with. Do you have a relationship with the participants? Do you have a relationship with this community? What is your relationship like? And how is your relationship with participants and with the community that the participants are connected with impacting or changing or influencing the, re the research that you're attempting to do? 
So for Odeji Go Day, relational accountability looked like planning evaluation alongside program development. And it was building awareness about the purpose and the intent of the evaluation as we developed the curriculum. And it involved listening to the youth who are involved in our youth advisory council. It involved listening to the elders, the cultural helpers, the knowledge holders, as well as the community members who were involved in the curriculum development working group. And it also involved being in conversation with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives here in Manitoba about using, modifying, and sharing the research bundle that they had created for their uh, research evaluation of another program that was here in Winnipeg, CEDA, um, for their published document. And my Ojibwe is not fantastic, but I'm going to uh, share an attempted pronunciation. Naga mo wabishiki ojijak bimize kitawetano, which translates to singing white crane flying north. So one of the co-creators of Singing White Crane Flying North is Carla Kirkpatrick. And in the spirit of relational accountability, I had a previously existing relationship with Carla. Uh, she and I had done some work together in some conferences, and this is how I knew about her methodology. So I approached her, and then she encouraged me to approach the other folks that were involved at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives so that we could be in conversation about sharing this methodology, as well as integrating this methodology with into Odeji Uode. We also received their permission to modify the bundle that they had created for Singing White Crane Flying North for Odeji Go Day. Um, so in Singing White Crane Flying North, they use the bundle as a post-test measure for lack of a better phrase. So they do it at the end. And Odeji Go Day has modified this bundle so that we're doing it at the beginning in the first lesson of the 13 lessons curriculum and in the final lesson of the 13 lessons curriculum. So from a Eurocentric perspective, uh, this would be considered like a pre-test post-test measure. And instead of thinking of it as a pre-test post-test measure, I would really encourage you to think about it from a perspective of relational accountability in that in looking at what the youth know in the beginning and what the youth know in the end, we are fulfilling an obligation to our relationship with the participants to allow them time and space to, so that they can present how their knowledge has changed, how they've created a collective understanding of knowledge, what their perspectives, what their beliefs, what their understanding of topics around healthy relationships, how has that shifted throughout their involvement with Odeji Go Ode over the 13 lessons. So, and that's a change of perspective that shifts from pretest, potest, what did you know, what didn't you know, to now, what do you understand as we move through this process together? And then we'll shift to the next slide to talk about the actual bundle. So the sacred bundle within Odeji Go Ode, again, is modeled off of the Singing White Crane Flying North bundle. Um, and it begins with ceremony. So for Odeji Go Ode, uh, this ceremony was led by a cultural helper or an elder, and it involved smudging and a calling in song to begin. And then involves the creation of safer spaces and relationship. So this is done through an opening sharing circle with introductions, sharings, and the sharings are not just coming from the youth, they're coming from the cultural helper, they're coming from the elder, they're coming from the facilitators, and the youth are also invited to participate. And participation can look like listening, or it can look like speaking, or it can look like both, because participation at different times can be different for different folks. And it's also important to understand that we cannot guarantee safety. So it's creation of a safer space, because I, as a research facilitator, cannot know every single thing that the youth participants have experienced. I don't know what language is going to, you know, create dysregulation in their nervous systems. I don't know their entire life story, so I cannot assume safety for them. But through the creation of relationship, my goal as a research facilitator is to create a safer space. And that also means that participants have the choice to participate only by listening. And the next piece of the bundle is the introduction of story and the methods. 
So this is done by the cultural helper, the elder, or the facilitator. And for Odejigo Ode, it was the sharing of the story of the sacred tree. And then we moved to the arts creation method. So for Odejigo Ode, we used the uh, tree of life, also known as the sacred tree. So it is a tool that is congruent with indigenous methodology, epistemology, and axology. And the tree of life specifically was chosen for the Odejigo Ode curriculum because we have stories and teachings about trees throughout the curriculum. So we have in our conflict resolution lesson, we have a story about the Métis giving tree. Uh, in our lesson about addictions and the use of substances within coping, we have the story about the addiction tree, which is shared with us by our uh, Angie Koti, who is the uh, a Cree woman and a uh, cultural helper who is involved in the curriculum working group. So there are different arts creation methods, and it's really important that the arts creation method that you are choosing if you are engaging in this kind of methods is grounded in place-based teachings. And place-based teachings is understanding that there's no single way of knowing, so that there's no single way of being, no single way of understanding. And while there may be similarities between Indigenous communities and their teachings, you cannot equate these similarities to sameness. So there is not one culture because culture is defined by the land, the language, and the nation of the people as said by Elder Jim DeMont. So it's really important that if you are choosing an arts creation method, it is place-based. And through the use of the arts creation method, the youth get to share their perspectives either through words or images, those sorts of things. And then we have a closing circle, which is a formal talking circle uh, with protocols and guidance from the elder or cultural helper. So the protocols for Odeji Go Ode involve not only offering tobacco to the cultural helper or elder who's leading the talking circle, but also to every participant, every youth who's sitting within that circle as an extension and a sign of respect for the knowledges that they are sharing with the collective. And then we have the sharing of food and the maintaining of relations. Uh, so this is through the creation of a spirit plate. Uh, this is in sharing in conversation. This is in sharing in food and the sharing of food for Odeji Go Ode when we were doing this uh, with our Youth Advisory Council through the times of COVID where we were meeting online. It involved not only feeding the youth, but it also involved feeding the families of the youth and the members of the household as a sign of respect for the time and the energy that the youth were putting into participating with our research. And then it ends with ceremony. Uh, so this is, was again, a cultural helper, elder leading, smudging, uh, cleansing ceremony so that anything that doesn't need to be carried into the rest of the youth's day, the rest of the youth's life can be cleansed and their prayers can also be offered to creator. And we'll have the next slide. So this is one of the images that was used as a template for the sacred tree. Um, the youth were encouraged to draw their own sacred tree, but if they chose not to, uh, we had a couple different templates that they could add their imagery onto or their words onto. And I'm gonna share the story of the sacred tree. Um, and I'm gonna share a brief version of the story of the sacred tree because it's from this book. And this book is actually quite long. Um, and this version of the uh, sacred tree was written by Phil Lane Jr., Michael Bopp, Judy Bopp, and Lee Brown in 1984. So the story of the sacred tree. For all of the people of the earth, the creator has planted a sacred tree under which they may gather and there find healing, power, wisdom, and security. The roots of this tree spiral deep into the body of Mother Earth. Its branches reach upwards like hands praying to Father Sky. The fruits of this tree are the good things that the creator has given to the people. Teachings that show the path to love, compassion, generosity, patience, wisdom, justice, courage, respect, humility, and many other wonderful gifts. The ancient ones taught us that the life of the tree is the life of the people. If the people wander far away from the protective shadow of the tree, if they forget to seek nourishment of its fruit, or if they should turn against the tree and attempt to destroy it, great sorrow will fall upon the people. Many will become sick at heart. The people will lose their power. They will cease to dream dreams and see visions. 
They will begin to quarrel among themselves over worthless trifles. They will become unable to tell the truth and to deal with each other honestly. They will forget how to survive in their own land. Their lives will become filled with anger and gloom. Little by little, they will poison themselves and all they touch. It was foretold that these things would come to pass, but the tree would never die. And as long as the tree lives, the people live. It was foretold that the day would come when the people would awaken as if from a long drugged sleep that they would begin timidly at first, but then with great urgency to search again for the sacred tree. The knowledge of its whereabouts and of the fruits that adorn its branches have always been carefully guarded and preserved within the minds and hearts of our wise elders and leaders. These humble, loving, and dedicated souls will guide anyone who is honestly and sincerely seeking along the path leading to the protective shadow of the tree. The book is called The Sacred Tree. <laughs> so the arts creation method uh, with this image or the image that the youth were um, creating was after the story was read, they were then encouraged to draw or write words for each section of the tree. So uh, the ground where the tree is upon is about belonging and there are questions posed about belonging, such as who are the important people in your life right now? So how youth answer that question in the first lesson may be different than how youth answer that question in the last lesson. The roots are about identity and pose questions to consider about personal identity, such as where, where do you feel most at home? And again, that may be different from beginning to end. It might not. The trunk of the tree is about mastery and poses questions about personal strengths and skill and knowledges. And it asks you to consider what successes have you had recently or in your life? And again, that might look different beginning to end. It might also look different because youth might be defining success differently from beginning to end. The branches are about independence and pose questions to consider about personal goals and accomplishments, such as how do you experience interacting with others? The leaves are about the future and pose questions to consider about hopes and dreams, such as questions about what hopes, what dreams do you have currently? The fruit on the tree are about generosity and pose questions about individual gifts, such as how can you support others? And then the environment surrounding the tree is about external con contributors to one's environment and poses questions about feeling supported and nurtured to grow. So when we first did this activity with our youth advisory council, um, one of the members drew like lightning and really dark clouds around their tree and they were indicated that that was a representation of how they didn't feel like they were supported in their current environment. Like they didn't feel like anyone was looking out for them. And in fact, the lightning was coming actually to bring them down. And that was their experience in the first lesson, their first sharing with Odeji Wode as the Youth Advisory Council member. And then their tree at the end, they were able to add fruit and they were able to color in the leaves green. And I believe there was even a sunshine wearing like smiley glasses on it. And it, that was a, an excellent visual representation of how things had shifted for them. And we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So as a part of this bundle, we have a sharing circle. And now there are differences between sharing circles and talking circles. So Elder Jim Dumont, who is an elder, an Ojibwe and Anishinaabe elder uh, of the Martin clan. And he's originally from Shonaga First Nation on Eastern Georgia Bay. He was working at the uh, University of Saskatchewan. Uh, when he gave this, he wrote an article and um, discussed the importance of circle. So he wrote that the circle, more than any other symbol, is most expressive of the Indigenous view of the world. The circle is primary to all of life and life processes and is also of primary significance in relating to and understanding life itself in all of its dimensions and diversity. Human beings amongst other beings are in harmony with the life flow and grow to their greatest fulfillment 
when they too operate in a circular fashion. The circle then, being primary, influences in every way how we see the world. The circle is synonymous with wholeness. Wholeness is the perception of the undivided entirety of things. To see in a circular manner is to envision the interconnectedness and the interdependentness within life. The wholeness of life is the circle of life. And this is also another way of considering the teaching of relational accountability, because if we're all interconnected, if we're all interdependent, of course, we need to treat one another with respect, reciprocity, and we have to honor the responsibilities that we have to one another. So gathering and sharing circles have many different purposes, amongst them being learning and teaching. Uh, there's also sharing circles that are for healing. And sharing circles provide the context for the presentation of each and every participant's thoughts, ideas, feelings, as well as the development of an understanding without hierarchy with an emphasis on interconnectedness. So Odejigo Ode works primarily with youth. So if we think about youth and the settings where they're typically within, there's a hierarchy. So if we think about a high school classroom setting, there's a teacher at the front of the room and the children or the youth sitting in desks, in rows, in lines, at the back of the classroom. So the teacher is at the front of the classroom in a position of authority, just by positionality within the room. So when we gather in circle, we sit side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and it includes the facilitator, it includes the cultural helper, it includes the elder, and everyone is side by side, everyone is equal and connected within that circular shape. So by changing the physical shape of the space, we also change the relationships. So sharing circles are led by an elder, a knowledge keeper, a cultural helper, a knowledge holder, or someone who has received a blessing from an elder to hold the circle. And there are special prayers and sacred, sacred objects within this ceremony. So sharing circles are a ceremony. There is no time limit within sharing circles and people can share as much or as little as they would like. Sharing circle processes are grounded in protocols. And these protocols for circles are consistent with where you as a research are and where you and where and who your participants are. So it's important to be grounded in place-based practice in offering sharing circles or talking circles in your methods. Uh, so these protocols might include passing tobacco to whomever is facilitating your sharing circle or talking circle. And it may also include like we do in Ode Ji Go Ode, passing tobacco to each of the participants as a sign of respect for the knowledge that they are providing. And um, one of the elders that I, she's a grandmother that I work with, she offered the teaching about it in a sharing circle, listening respectfully extends beyond listening with our ears. So we listen with our eyes. We listen by looking at the speaker. We listen with our mouths. Um, so we listen by keeping our lips together and not talking. So we're not talking, we're not responding to what other folks are saying. We listen with our minds. So we can listen by thinking about what is being said by others instead of thinking about what we're going to say next, if it's our turn or what we're going to do later in that day, it can be nerve wracking sitting in a circle and be like, oh, it's my turn, it's my turn, what am I gonna say? But listening with our minds is really paying attention to what the folks around you are sharing and then responding and speaking from your heart instead of your mind. And then we're gonna listen with our hearts. So we listen by caring about what others are saying and why they are saying it. And in this um, circle led by uh, grandmother Sherry uh, Copanets, um, she always said, if you, you can rub your heart, if you're feeling for someone, you can rub your heart. Because so often we wanna reach out and touch other folks to offer them comfort, but instead offering that comfort by rubbing your heart. And then we'll move to talking circles. So talking circles are based on the sacred tradition of sharing circles. And in a talking circle, we need to ensure that we're respectful of everyone's time and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to share. So the purpose of a talking circle is to create a safe environment in which participants can share their point of view with others. And just like in a sharing circle, each participant within the talking circle is equal and each one belongs. Everyone in the circle learns to listen and respect the views of others. And the intention is to open our hearts and to understand and connect with one another. So it's important within talking circles that there is no interruption and that the validation comes through listening, not through verbal validation. 
as well, all voices are equal in giving space and opportunity to share and to be heard. So through engagement in circle, one of the best benefits for participants, especially in the case of Odeji Go Day, when we're working with youth who are participating, is that they can hear others in the circle, others who are the same age as them, others that look like them, who may share their experiences, who have similar stories, who share their feelings. And so that a sense of belonging can be facilitated because it can be extremely isolating to be a human and never mind being an urban indigenous youth uh, with experiences of racism, with experiences of classism, with experiences of poverty, experiences of colonialism. All of these things are extremely isolating and you can often feel like you're the only one. So when you sit in circle and hear other folks saying similar things to what you're, you've experienced, saying similar things to what you are feeling, it's extremely validating and it creates that relation, it creates that sense of community. And through the use of circles at Odeji Go Ode with the Youth Advisory Council and the subsequent shift of authority from the facilitator, the researcher, uh, the, the elders, uh, the experiences and the stories of the youth have taught us about what topics needed to be included within the curriculum, what activities were interesting and beneficial, what learning was or was not occurring from the materials as they were currently offered in the curriculum so that it can be beneficial to other Indigenous youth. Um, so this is how we have engaged in youth-led processes throughout the entirety of this process. We have had I think five versions of our curriculum um, before the Youth Advisory Council were content with it and ready for it to be presented to other youth in the community. And within Circle, there's also a really powerful reminder for not only youth, but researchers and adults in the Circle um, that we don't know what we don't know until we listen. We are very much out of touch with youth experiences, or at least I was very out of touch with youth experiences. And it's a really powerful reminder that unless we make space to hear these experiences without parameters, without expectations, without censorship, we're not going to know what we don't know until we listen. And this is why sharing of story is so powerful. And there has been great concern within doing research within the Indigenous communities about how exploitive it can be. And Marissa touched on this. And Kovach, uh, as Marissa mentioned, she talked about how there's a need for the information to be an exchange and not a smash and grab. And there is significant concern that colonial qualitative methodologies are smash and grab because there is this need within colonial qualitative methodologies to be objective. So you as a researcher cannot be a part of the story, but within indigenous methodology, within this indigenous paradigm, Knowledge exchange and data collection should be grounded in these interdependent relationships, which are developed through space and time for both the participants and the researcher or the facilitator to share their experiences and thoughts, as well as reflections and knowledges received from other individuals. And this is how the integration of sharing circles and talking circles can assist in this interdependent relational accountability spaces. So through the inclusion of story within research, through, which is done through the inclusion of sharing circles, talking circles, research becomes holistic, it becomes relational, and it becomes consistent with worldviews and Indigenous values, as well as the history and traditions of Indigenous peoples. Again, with the parameter that it needs to be grounded in the protocols of the place and the space that you are in, the lands, the language, and the nation of whom you are working with. So there is this understanding within Eurocentric research that talking circles are similar to focus groups and therefore, and such as we can prevent, we can present this to ethic committees as validation for their efficacy. So in presenting focus group as in presenting talking circles as focus groups, we're missing an opportunity to consider how talking circles as a method are an embodiment of Indigenous epistemological importance of relationships. So without the Indigenous axiology, the set of beliefs and morals, a talking circles is not an Indigenous method, and it is instead a focus group. 
So it is the axology, the inclusion of the morals and beliefs, the protocols and ethics, the inclusion of the elder, the inclusion of the appropriate facilitators, the inclusion of those policies, practices, ethics that are place-based that shifts the methods from being a focus group to an Indigenous methodology, aka a talking circle. So within talking circles, within sharing circles, you are not only listening to storytelling and personal narratives, you are also contributing to the narrative and influencing the narrative. So this is where that objective piece cannot exist. You cannot be objective within this model of care because you are in relationship and your relationship with participants matters. Your relationship with their community matters. And this is when maybe you don't have a bias, but maybe you made a comment that then subsequently censors someone that um, maybe it's a, it makes them realize that this isn't a safe space to share about that topic. So being aware of the things that you say, the values that you hold, the beliefs that you have is incredibly important because you are in relationship with your participants and your personal narrative influences the narrative that is shared within your research. And this again, returns us to the understanding about how we are always in relationship and how there needs to be relational accountability. And then I have my references. Thank you so much, Rochelle, that was wonderful. Um, and so at this time, we're going to have a question and answer period. So I invite everyone to um, go ahead and ask any questions that you may have in the chat and we will read them out to make sure that we um, address all questions there. So take a few moments if you would, um, and we'll wait for some to come in. I guess as we wait, I can start with one. <laughs> Sometimes asking the first question is a bit nerve wracking. Um, so I really appreciated all of the um, different kind of concrete guidelines for things to do and ways to really engage in this work in a meaningful way. Um, but are there any recommendations for how to really build those um, skills? So for example, the recommendation to to listen without thinking about what you want to say next, I think can be um, a difficult thing for people to do. So any advice for ways that they could practice or build those capacities? Lionel, did you want to share something to that regard or should I? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, um, just by sharing is, is the first step, you know, in the, we're, we're all trying to, to, to learn. And uh, so it's gonna take some time and, 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 and a process for, for that to finally become the norm, you know, because a lot of us uh, were taught different ways of learning and understanding things. So it's, uh, and especially if, you're, if you have a circle of, of youth, for instance, that's been traumatized more than most of their life, they have uh, coping mechanisms that uh, they have to be able to block things so that, that they don't feel uh, any anxiety or discomfort. So relearning to think, again, relearning to be comfortable with uh, even speaking up, you know, about certain things. So uh, I guess the biggest thing is when we talk about uh, sharing circles and we talk about the, our role uh, as people in the sharing circle, talking circle, or even our role in their lives, is one of the things that I, I recognize is that Western culture is an individual-based culture. It's about me. But uh, uh, Indigenous culture is community-based. And so what that means as community-based is as we sit there, we're re when we talk about all the way through about relations, the relational and relationships, that's what it's about. So when we sit in those circles, we have to become uh, family members. So if you're if you're older than uh, most of those youth, then uh, chances are you become an auntie. You know, and it doesn't mean you're uh, you're replacing them. You're just filling in uh, because their aunties aren't there. That's our responsibility as community members. And so we have all these different roles. So. Uh, because 
many of our people come from dysfunctional lifestyles and, and historical traumas, uh, we have to relearn even relationships. Okay, so when you talk about relationships, most of the most of our young people aren't taught like you would have a close-knit family, you know. Their relationships are taught with abuse, you know, and the, uh, when a young girl and a young boy get into a relationship, they don't, all they're going on is what they see, you know, because uh, uh, for women, mothers don't put them on their knees and say, this is your role and responsibility as a woman in a relationship. And the men don't do that with the boys saying, this is your role and responsibility. They watch. And because there's so much dysfunctional, they think that's the norm, right? So uh, it's our responsibility uh, as a as, um, community is to help restructure that so it becomes more of a positive experience rather than uh, 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 a belief that that's just the way life is okay? because many of our people don't recognize choice yeah. is that good enough okay. yeah. that was wonderful Danny says, uh, i should have called you on and on so you have to shut me up eh Oh, never. <laughs> um, but related to that, actually, there's a, a question in the chat. So I'll just read that out loud. Um, it says, thank you for sharing. In our practices of evaluation, especially when there is an interaction with a group, um, we often have to kind of collect within a specific time limit. So for example, a two-hour workshop. So how do you suggest uh, we have this constraint progress to a more respectful, dynamic space um, with time to share and listen. You talking to me? Yeah, you, Rochelle, oh, okay. Marissa, oh, everyone. Maybe Marissa can answer that. I mean, uh, I don't really put you on the spot, Marissa, but uh, I think you're more of an expert than I am. Uh, definitely not. I would love to hear everyone's thoughts on this. I mean, my initial thought is that a step back needs to be taken and kind of going back you know, to the community and working together. It has to be a collaborative process when you're designing that method, um, the time frame, what the data collection method looks like. And you have to share on your end, you know, these are, this is what I'm bringing to the table. This is what I'm coming in with. These are what I typically do. What does this look like for you and your community? Um, and if, you know, the community shares that this time limit doesn't, isn't, you know, conducive with our values, with the way we do things, then it has to be honored and you have to find um, a different way to go about it. So I would suggest taking that step back and really just working with your partners on that. But what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I guess the other thing too is from uh, Indigenous uh, Lens is that we're um, an oral based culture, which is uh, uh, it's important to us when somebody comes to write, um, we're kind of hesitant about what are you doing? You know, and then that's, that's the trying to marriage the both, um, <coughs> excuse me, marriage the both the cultures uh, and differences together and, and getting comfortable with working with people that <coughs> excuse me, are, are jotting things out and finding information because we still have that mistrust amongst us, you know, with, uh, with the dominant society, because uh, especially as of late, because of the residential school experience. And so that, that resurfaced the mistrust again, you know? So if you're writing something, that's, that's scary stuff for, for our people um, because uh, too many systems were in place to, um, uh, to, to damage us, right? So, uh, but in a talking circle, sharing circle, a talking circle, for sure you have to, <clears throat> you can document because you're talking about stuff. In a sharing circle, you can't do that kind of stuff. And if you are, it has to be approved by the group and then you cannot sit in the circle. You have to sit on the outside of the circle because so there's, there's no interruption and, and no fears, you know, in the, some of the stuff that you put, um, that you talked about, Marissa, and uh, Rachel, about some of the elders that you talked about and, and with regarding sharing circles and stuff is that uh, we have to understand that when we sit in the circle, it's representing because we're all high level, we're equal. 
you know. So if you're documenting somebody, something, and nobody else is, that takes you out of that equation of being equal, you know. So that's why you sit on the outside of the circle to to document stuff like that. <clears throat> it also means that, and it's unfortunate, because uh, uh, when we go and approach with method, how do you say that word, methodology? Uh, <clears throat> we're starting to look more from a scientific perspective rather than uh, a, a natural process, right? And I guess it has to be done. I don't know, but uh, for us, it's um, uh, that's just um, the natural way of, of learning and understanding, you know? So we're trying to move away from uh, and move back to the natural process. Okay, so, for instance, uh, uh, what I noticed, and I talk uh, quite a bit about this of late, is that we had forgotten that uh, we are from the human family. Just like the four-leggeds are from the four-legged families and the winged ones are from the, the winged family, is that we managed to find a way to separate and isolate and individualize uh, 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 the human family. And so uh, we no longer operate as, as, uh, as part of the, the whole, right? And so, and that's, that's the big, a big concern amongst the uh, uh, relationship building, right? So, uh, um, but in, in Western culture, that's what they need. So I think the best way to do that is if you're gonna do that, you're also gonna miss out on a lot. Right? Because you're doing it mentally and not through the heart. Right? Because you're not going to be able to um, process uh, how it's affecting you. You know, the conversation or what's being said there, uh, you're, you're processing it from a, a mental aspect. So uh, you are gaining that knowledge mentally, but uh, you removed yourself from your growth and development because you're not listening with your heart. Right? And just to clarify, like uh, some of the points that Lionel shared, um, for Odeji Go Day, the sharing circles that we open with, the opening circle is a sharing circle. So it there's no, that's not a part of the um, transcriptions. That's not a part of the formulated data set at all because it is ceremony. Um, and that is the part where we are engaging in relationship building and we are sitting together uh, shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye uh, as equals. And then within the talking circles, there is actually no documentation within the talking circles. It is um, an audio recording that the uh, youth uh, consent to uh, through verbal and or um, signed consent uh, so that the researcher, the facilitator, everyone is fully engaged in sitting in circle and not worried about what is or is not being documented because there's an audio transcription being made. And then with um, the assistance of the Youth Advisory Council methods, that transcription is then going to be, um, the word is gone. Um, Analyze. That's not the word I want to use, though. But <laughs> uh, then we'll look at themes with in collaboration with the Youth Advisory Council um, of the other, uh, like of the actual research um, talking circles. Yeah, <laughs> to identify different themes that they also see, so that it's not just myself with my understanding of the topic, looking at the depth of knowledge that the youth are offering. It's also the Youth Advisory Council with their breadth of knowledge sharing in that experience. Just one more thing on that is that uh, please don't mistake what I'm saying. It's uh, we're trying to marry both cultures. So uh, when we talk about sitting there and documenting it, um, trying to get a better understanding, we have to have that balance and be able to respect both cultures, you know. And so we have to come together. And, and in, in order to do that, we have to create that relationship first and say, this is what I do, so I'm going to do this. You know, and uh, just so that uh, uh, they are aware that, that um, 
we're not doing this to harm you. We're doing this to uh, come together finally after all these years because uh, there are prophecies in our culture. And, and I'll just quickly share one is that, uh, you know, I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, there's a prophecy that says that one day the four colors of man will come together and become one mighty nation. And it goes on to say that, but before that can happen, the other three colors of man have to come back to the red man to relearn what they forgot. Okay, so, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. That's, that's more I can say about it, but I, I think that in order for that to happen is that we have to engage with one another, whichever way, shape, or form. At some point, uh, I think when we move away from the scientific uh, idea and start recognizing, you know what, uh, all this um, scientific stuff um, really doesn't make sense within the, uh, uh, the indigenous world view. Okay? Because uh, I think that from the indigenous world view, everything's always changing. There's, it's movement all the time. So everything's not gonna be the same, right? And so when we, uh, and, and that's why when we're oral based, I think that by writing it down, which is important, but when we write it down, that says that that's the rule, that's the law, right? And, uh, uh, and so it's misleading both nations to uh, understanding that, you know, uh, we're trying to marry that. At some point, we have to figure out together is that uh, it's about understanding who Indigenous people are. And uh, for Indigenous people, it's understanding uh, relationship wise with uh, European culture. You know, one that's more from a healthy perspective rather than a, a negative. The unfortunate thing about that is that uh, you're missing you're missing what's important to you, and so you separated yourself for the um, for science. Okay, and uh, you're important when it comes to those uh, those circles and, and those conversations. Okay, and uh, because you too have to grow, not mentally, but hardly. That's important for, for all of us in order to, uh, to understand each other. And because we're no different. I believe it was Sitting Bull, I think, or yeah, Sitting Bull or Black Elk, one of them said that if you cut me, I bleed red. If we cut you, you bleed red as well. How are we so different? And so we just have to get rid of that. Uh, I do this one thing with, with couples and relationships, you know, I blindfold them. So it takes away uh, distraction, you know, when they're having a hard time. And, and now they can hear what their heart's saying rather than distractions around them. And for men, it's, it's super important for that because we're not hard people. Women are the hard people and the nurturers. So, uh, now we can listen with our hearts. So now we hear what the woman is saying, you know, and uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have to get rid of the distraction so that uh, we can hear each other what we're saying. I love that. Wonderful. So I so much appreciate everyone's um, contributions to this. Um, Lionel, if you would um, maybe have a few more moments to say any closing remarks that you have on your mind. Um, sure. I just want to thank everybody for being here, first of all. Um, I also just want you all to know that um, life is about mistakes too. You know, so it's okay to make mistakes. But just don't repeat it. Just learn from it. What is it uh, that I did wrong so that it doesn't happen again? And uh, because we're trying to come together as one, there's going to be a lot of differences. There's going to be a lot of uh, 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 
misunderstanding of messages from one another. You know, and we have to just process that before we act on it. Okay, to what is their meaning for them? They're saying that and vice versa, the native people. Like we have to try to figure out the, in the simplest way to uh, what do they mean by that? You know, so we will be making mistakes as we, we learn about each other. Um, relationships, if anything I can say is that we are one family. Try to wrap yourself around that concept of that. Uh, just because you're not my blood relative doesn't mean we're not related. We're in this together. You know, I mean, uh, that's why the the uh, the four elements of life was created for everybody, not just one power or one people. It belonged to everybody. And uh, if we destroy any one of those, we're all in trouble, not just one. Maybe that's what it's going to take to recognize that, you know, we're in this together. So um, you are all my, my daughters. You're all young. So I, I would teach you the same way I teach my own children. You know, and I'll, I'll um, make life better for you like I do with you now, without seeing any separation or disconnect, or because you're somebody else's child. Uh, like I said, uh, filling in for uh, how many members that should be here with you, uh, talking to you about this and then guiding you and helping you understand. Uh, when we look at uh, Indigenous people from, uh, from their lands. Is that historically, we're, we're coming out of a dark era. Okay, so it's a uh, mutation with us. It's going to take a little bit of time to, to tell the truth to you, to uh, the European culture and mainstream culture. Uh, but we're working on it and we're getting stronger. And, uh, uh, but we're still behind. Okay, so uh, it's not that we don't want to share with you. It's just that uh, our guard is up still. And uh, how we do that, I like what uh, Marissa was saying. Is it Marissa? That what she was saying about when she goes into the community, you know, uh, and she talks with the elders, helps the elders, all that. Well, that's becoming part of the community without any expectations, you know, and that's how. Uh, we're starting to become family. That's so important. I did work with a Pfizer company and uh, uh, the Canadian Army. Uh, they would go into the native communities and, and their uh, camouflage gear and the, uh, these people from uh, Pfizer coming in with their suitcases and suits and stuff and coming into a reserve. Do you know how intimidating that is? Everybody, it became a desert on that reserve because what they didn't know was that's how they came and took our children. So when I sat with them, I said, do you have to first announce yourself your family? Nobody's going to come running to you and uh, with open arms and say, no, you're going to save us. No, you have to prove to them that you're part of their community. So without trying to sell them things first, they can know who they are. And then once they, if they embrace you, then they will give you your part of the community. Okay, so there's a, uh, uh, you're not separated. But if you don't make that connection, you are not part of the community. You're on the outside trying to get in. Okay, so I think that uh, you're doing wonderful work. Uh, this is building the nation. Um, maybe we have to go through the scientific uh, stage first uh, to gain that understanding and that knowledge. But we have to be very careful because um, with science and with uh, indigenous world views, well, sometimes what we're doing with that is that we're, we're, we're painting that picture that this is the way that it is, not your way. And we have to be careful that it's not, it's not pointed out to be that way. You know, so that they don't see it as a threat and they see it as part of a process of, of uh, unification. Okay. So I think that you're all doing wonderful jobs. I, I love hearing uh, the speakers speak today. And um, uh, I just, uh, I think we're on the right track. 
you know, and uh, like please, if you need to, if you don't understand something, go we'll talk to the elders wherever you are, you know, because they will give you clarity, you know, and uh, but don't try to uh, to guess, because sometimes we put our foot in our mouth when we do that. Because we're now saying that this is how it should be. You know, so talk to the elders and. And I'm glad to see a lot of the elders' presentations you talked about that the Holy Spirit and that, that, that relationship is building already. But always remember to go to the elders first if you don't understand something. And they're all over North America. So, and, uh, and they're easy to approach. There's protocols, but uh, we, can, we can talk about that with, with, uh, with your, your circle of friends that are native. So how do I approach the elders the, the protocol? You know, because uh, uh, first of all, tobacco, I will mention just this medicine, is that tobacco was the first medicine that was given to the Anishinaabe people. You know, they way across the land, whether it's uh, uh, your Sioux, whether it's your Blackfoot, whether it's your uh, Oneida, uh, uh, Winnebago, it's all the same. Tobacco was the first medicine that was given to all of us. That's the conductor to all spirits. So when we give that tobacco, we're talking to the spirits about what we're asking for. And we're also talking to that elder or the person we give tobacco to, because we're talking to their spirit helpers as to why you're offering this. So that wakes them up, and, and now they come together and start to work with us. It's also a, a sign of commitment that somebody accepts that. Now they're committed to the process of what you're asking for. Okay, so uh, the, the importance of tobacco when you're asking those kinds of questions because uh, when they smoke it, there's all your prayers that go up. They don't inhale it. It's not good with hyphen and goes up. And uh, now because they're praying for you now. And so, uh, yeah, but always remember that. Um, there's no right way, no wrong way. It's all about learning, getting on, learning to understand one another. And, uh, related to everybody. That's why all of creation in that circle, there isn't uh, one that's higher than the other. It's all equal in there. And like that circle, it's always evolving. It's like the relationship that you are building with education, um, with knowledge, and um, with, uh, with other nations. It is going to evolve. Yeah. So, I guess I'll stop there. Anybody said on and on? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your words, your wisdom. Um, I know I've learned so much today. Thank you also to Rochelle and to Marissa for your time, your presentation. Um, it was wonderful. And thank you to everyone who, um, who showed up today to be a part of this conversation. Um, just as a reminder, there will be a link in the chat that Stacey, um, she just stare, shared, excuse me. Um, if you would please just take two minutes to fill this out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we wanna learn how we can improve these webinars and build on them in the future. Um, and then again, at the end, you will be directed to um, a sheet for your certific certification of attendance. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. We really appreciate it um, and hope to see you at another event in the future. <laughs>